Hello, everybody. My name is Al Pisano, and I'm the Dean of the Jacobs School of Engineering here at UC San Diego. And today, I am the luckiest Dean in the country because I get to sit with Marty Cooper uh, and talk to him about the 50th anniversary of the first handheld cell phone call. So, uh, Marty, I'm so happy to be here, as I said. We brought your book, Cutting the Cord, and we know uh, that you have had an incredible career as an engineer at Motorola, an entrepreneur in your own right, and of course, a national academician. So I thought we might get started, and I would just ask, I'm sure everyone is trying to celebrate this 50th anniversary with you. Can you give me an idea about how much they've been asking you to run around and celebrate with them? Well, first of all, uh, let me tell you, it's my uh, privilege and I'm lucky to be here with you. <laughs> oh, and, and, and I value our friendship greatly and, and I value the fact that I'm lucky enough to uh, live uh, here uh, very close to the UCSD. Uh, that, that in itself is a privilege to me. So uh, we're making a big fuss about the 50th anniversary. My first reaction is, what took so long? <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the fact is that uh, my colleagues uh, believe, as I do, that people don't really recognize that the cell phone has not been here always. Everybody takes it for granted. Uh, and I think it's important that people realize, uh, first of all, that the cell phone did just happen, that it almost didn't happen. Uh, and secondly, that we are only at the beginning of what I refer to as the cell phone revolution. So, Marty, let me ask you to emphasize that first piece that you teased us with, that it almost didn't happen. And I, I reinforce that everyone thinks, well, you know, it's a done deal, right? It was obvious at the time. Everyone wanted it, didn't they? It sounds like maybe that wasn't the case. Tell us the, what's the real story about it maybe not happening. Well, of course, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, there were a lot of skeptics. Nobody really thought, very few people thought that the cell phone would be a profound something. After all, we had the telephone. Everybody in the world uh, had a telephone. Uh, and the uh, people that invented the concept of cellular, you know, having multiple cell sites, it was the Bell system. Uh, you're too young to remember the Bell system, Al. <laughs> but uh, this was a monopoly. Uh, you had to, at, at some uh, points in our uh, lives, you couldn't even buy a telephone. You had to rent it from the phone company, and it was always a black phone. It always had a dial on it. Uh, and uh, they had actually thought about the idea of cellular in 1947. And at our usually, usual rapid pace, uh, in 1968, they decided maybe they should implement that. And their version of cellular telephony, it was, first of all, car phones. You know, we had been trapped at our desks uh, and in our homes by this telephone wire. Now we're going to be trapped uh, in our car. Uh, at Motorola, we didn't think that, that was reasonable at all. And their second view uh, was that they were going to be a monopoly. That no one else, the reason for that was that they uh, didn't believe there was much of a market. Uh, they uh, hired a, an accounting firm to uh, study that, and the conclusion of this firm was uh, it, there would never be more than a million phones in the world that were car phones, a million cellular phones. And of course, they were right. The maximum number of car phones that existed in the world were about a million. Uh, as you know, uh, there are more cellular uh, handheld cellular phones today than there are people. About two thirds of the people on earth uh, have subscriptions to uh, tele cellular phones. So uh, there's been a great deal of, of uh, progress since then. Okay, so why did it not, almost not happen? Right. If, if, if remember now, the Bell system was the biggest company in the world by every measure. And Motorola was this little company uh, in Chicago and we decided to take the Bell system on because if they had succeeded, the systems would have been built for car phones. A, a handheld phone simply would not have worked. The power was not high enough. So 
if, if we had not succeeded, if we had not persuaded the FCC and the Congress to uh, allow the marketplace to decide what these phones were gonna be, it might have been another 10 or 20 years before we had handheld phones. So it really it might have been a very different world. So Marty, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that we have yet again a story that we tell over and over again today in a different context, that uh, there's a David versus Goliath issue behind every entrepreneurial thinking. Uh, I hadn't realized it was quite the David versus Goliath situation with you, Motorola, and of course, Bell. But what we have here is a brick, as I understand. Um, I've never used a brick. Uh, the closest I ever got was putting concrete on it and stacking them to make a wall. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you got to this particular brick, uh, as I think is the uh, nickname uh, for this cell phone. Sure. Uh, this is a, a bottle of, it's an exact bottle of the very first uh, handheld cell phone. Does that include uh, the weight? See, because it weighs a couple of pounds. Actually, it weighs about a kilo, two and a half pounds. The battery life of this unit was 25 minutes. Oh my goodness. Uh, that really wasn't a problem because you couldn't hold it up for 25 minutes. It's so <laughs> heavy. So, uh, and uh, the design actually didn't start out that way. Uh, I, when I decided that we needed to do a dazzling demonstration if we were gonna get the attention of the FCC, uh, of the uh, Congress, to let them know this travesty that the Bell system was trying to uh, implement uh, to us against society, uh, specifically against Motorola, because uh, they wanted not only take over uh, telephone communications, but two-way radio communications, which was uh, our business. Why? They didn't think the market was big enough. They didn't think, uh, as a result of their studies, that there would ever be a really large number of phones. So they were doing this just because it was, it was an obligation. So at some point uh, in this discussion, uh, we were starting to worry about whether the Bell system was going to be successful. And the management decided, Motorola management decided, that they were going to go to Washington, go to New York, and put out a demonstration of two-way radios. And so that we could, they could persuade the Congress and the FCC how important two-way radios were. Well, uh, Al, I have to tell you, there's nothing more boring than two-way radios, <laughs> even though the two-way radios are the glue that keeps uh, uh, police departments, fire departments, businesses going. Uh, when I tell my mother what I did for a living, she was really disappointed. <laughs> she wanted to be a, uh, to be to be a lawyer, a doctor, a judge. That would be nice, uh, but so uh, that's what I decided. You know, we have to have a dazzling demonstration, something that really keeps people's attention. Uh, and so I approached the management, told them I wanted to have this uh, demonstration not only be two-way radios, but let's show them what the real freedom is that you could get from being able to talk on a telephone moving everywhere. Doesn't sound very impressive to you, but at that time, uh, totally that was shocking. an impressive thing. So, so Marty, uh, let, me, let me jump in there for a second and explore an, an issue. Uh, you know, we've known each other almost 10 years. This is the first time you started talking about doing something with flair and excitement to shift the way people think. And I think, uh, was, was something like that behind your decision to make the first handheld cell phone call in New, from a street in New York to a particular person? What can you, is, was there an issue of dazzle that you were trying to introduce there when you made that call? The first call. Al, you ought to know the, about us engineers. We never achieve anything if we don't persuade people that we're, what we're doing is going to improve humanity, that's going to attract people's attention, that's going to be useful. Uh, and so uh, somehow you know, we engineers do get to be showmen from time to time, and that's exactly what we were doing uh, in, back in 1973. We were trying to do 
what I call a dazzling demonstration that people who were really grabbed people's attention. Uh, and that really was our intent. It was not to show off uh, this magnificent technology. It did, inter in fact, happen to be a demonstration of technology as, as well. Uh, because at that time, the technology to do 900 megahertz was uh, unimaginable. Nobody had done a, a, a two-way radio at 900 megahertz. Nobody had done a duplex radio where you could talk and listen at the same time. Nobody had put in a handheld device 500 radio channels. Wow. That had not been done, done before. So all of these things had to be done uh, in a period of three months, because that's wow. all we had. The demonstration was already planned for New York on April 3rd, 1973. And we had that amount of time to do. Fortunately, uh, we had that technology spread all over Motorola. All I had to do was go there, visit the other, other divisions, other departments, and I found pieces of technology everywhere. Uh, the management supported me and provided me with a team of the most marvelous engineers headed by a guy named Don Linder. The, uh, the design group that had to come up with a configuration. It was run by a guy named Rudy Krolov, uh, and he stopped work for the, he was working for the whole corporation. He stopped work for anybody else. He didn't stop charging them, you understand, <laughs> and, uh, and, and put his whole team to work designing what the future of a handheld portable telephone would look like. And these guys were magnificent. They came up with four different versions. And they're, they're pictured in, in my book. And there was a flip phone, there was a slider phone, there was a lozenge phone. Oh my phone. goodness. Uh, and we ended up selecting this phone because it was simple. The one thing we needed, didn't need it was a complicated thing that would break in the middle of a demonstration. So Marty, you introduced two themes in that story and I want to explore each of them. So the first one was, I think you took an incredibly entrepreneurial view, even though you were working for an established company, and you assembled a team that, such that you had enough people to do each piece of the puzzle, as it were, assemble each piece of the puzzle. Does that does that translate into any advice or wisdom that you could give young people today who are thinking of being entrepreneurs? Because it strikes me that you were acting like a pure entrepreneur in the middle of a big company. Uh, Motorola was small, but not tiny, so it was a big concern. Is, is there anything that you want to draw out or emphasize about that? Well, I ought to mention, you talked about uh, the lucky part of our relationship. The luckiest thing that ever happened to me business-wise is going to Motorola. Uh, because the founder of Motorola, a guy named Paul Galvin, uh, was an entrepreneur. Uh, and he uh, established a motto, which was emblazoned on the wall of our lobby. Do not fear failure. Reach out. And I took that seriously at, in my entire career. Uh, I never cared about whether I was going to be successful or not. It was whether what I was doing was right and, and was it a uh, correct thing to do. Uh, so uh, there again, uh, I, I just uh, am the luckiest person in the world because uh, for 30 years, uh, Motorola tolerated me. I was not a corporate guy. <laughs> and, and I did have uh, my share of uh, failures. Uh, which we could talk about, but I'd really much rather talk about our uh, successes. Successes, of course. Okay, so the other track that you really stimulated in my mind was talking about the technology of the phone. So first off, I'm, I'm just uh, excited to hear that so many visions of cell phones that we take for granted today and in, in a box at home, I have one of each of these, a flip, a slide and all that. So early on, you and your team, you know, th uh, it cooked up all those visions. Can you tell me a little bit about how the technology in this phone is related to technology today? When you said, for example, when you said 900 megahertz, I said, that sounds familiar. That's the uh, cordless phone I have at home. It talks to its base station. So 
How much similarity between a cell phone today uh, would this phone have now? In other words, talk to me about some generations and, and how we get from where you started to where we are. Well, as I mentioned, uh, this phone uh, was at 900 megahertz. Uh, in 1973, we were building two air radios at 450 megahertz, and we were pushing the technology. Okay. And, and these were, uh, we had uh, vacuum tube uh, final amplifiers because we couldn't do that with a transistor. Uh, we had a uh, uh, large-scale integrated circuit uh, in this unit, but it was very elementary. And it's the only way that you could do with uh, a thousand channels uh, in a uh, small thing like this. So uh, we, it was actually an experimental chip in, in our semiconductor division. Uh, a modern cell phone uh, has tens of thousands of radio channels, and they keep adding more and more all the time. In fact, the latest uh, cell phones actually are, have satellite uh, channels on them. So, uh, the, uh, of course, a modern phone has a camera and uh, has access to the internet. Uh, neither of those things existed in 1973. There were no digital cameras. The internet had not yet been uh, made a, a public uh, something. So, uh, there were the differences between that old phone uh, and today are, are, re are quite remarkable. Well, we could never have predicted all of those things could not only be put into a single handheld phone, but the one that was so small that you could, it could fit in your hand and drop in your pocket. Right. So what, what you're explaining now triggers a thought in my mind, which is cell phones are not, the, the, the industry of cell phones does not seem to have just quietly glided uh, from one beginning place uh, through an intermediate step to where we are now. It sounds like that there were revolutions and evolutions and sometimes cataclysmic changes. And so I don't know if a lot of people in the audience have ever heard of TDMA or CDMA or FDMA or some of these other things, uh, these protocols as it were. But, you know, I, I think starting from the brick and getting to a phone that we might pull out of our pocket now, there have been revolutions along the way, cataclysmic changes. Give the, give the audience a sense of that, because I, I want the younger uh, uh, prospective engineers, for example, to understand that it isn't always just smooth evolutionary sailing. Sometimes there are some precipices. So uh, explain some of that for us. That's a very crucial point that you made because the very first cell phones were actually analog. They used the same technology as an FM uh, radio. Uh, and the only problem with that uh, is that the capacity of a system using uh, analog technology is very limited and the ability to uh, have uh, 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 repeated signals over a city it was not nearly uh, good enough. So as we went through the years, uh, the, uh, we uh, uh, came up with new forms of modulation. First of all, uh, uh, TDMA, time division, multiple access. Uh, then uh, we came up with CDMA. Uh, today we use a combination of those uh, and a whole bunch of other technologies, all of them Reach it, trying to reach the limit of Shannon's law, which we are pretty much at now. We are, are, have gone as, about as far as you can go with the coding of the signals. And we still uh, uh, have run out of spectrum and are running out of spectrum. Uh, it is way we are, uh, but one of these things, we haven't gotten to what I do for a living now, uh, but uh, I, I have a belief that there are tools that we can use to improve the capacity of the spectrum. And I made an observation about 25 years ago that somehow or other, uh, from the time that Marconi made his uh, very first, his very first phone call, uh, which by the way, uh, involved uh, millions of watts of energy <laughs> in a very inefficient <laughs> way, that uh, from then until now, uh, we have doubled our, the capacity of the usable radio spectrum every 30 months. 
every two and a half years. If you do the arithmetic there, uh, we are now uh, ten, uh, 10 trillion times the capacity of the usable radio spectrum compared with uh, uh, Marconi. Uh, there are people who are now saying, well, we're at the limit. You, you just can't go any further. Uh, my uh, belief is that we are just beginning and that technology is that we already know today how to go another million times increasing capacity within the next 50 years or so. And there's uh, technologies that you just know that are going to come up later. So uh, I actually uh, uh, created a, a law. I call it the law of spectrum capacity. Some people call it Cooper's law. Yes. As long as you believe it, I don't mind their calling it Cooper's law. If you don't believe it, uh, <laughs> we'll, we're, we'll, we'll call it the Santos <laughs> law. But uh, uh, I, uh, there is no question in my mind that if people use this, uh, the, the modern technologies, and we're not going to run out of spectrum in the foreseeable future. Okay, so Marty, uh, you know, you, uh, this part of the story uh, for me t uh, brings out an important point. It seems that almost every technology reaches some sort of limit. Steam engines can only go so fast. Carriages can only, you know, go so fast. Airplanes can only go so fast. But they reach that limit at a certain time in a technology arc. Then everyone seems to crowd up against that limit. And then there's someone who breaks through, right? From propeller engines, they went to jet engines. Whoops, twice the speed. Who'd have thought? Is there, is there some pattern that you're seeing? So, or, and bring it back to the spectrum, if you like. This seems to be sort of like a, a, a dialectic in engineering. You know, everyone sees a, a barrier, we all crowd up against it. Someone breaches the barrier, we all rush through. I think in several times in your story, uh, in the short time we've spent together, that pattern has emerged over and over again. You did your best you could with vacuum tubes, but eventually there was a way around later on. Um, did you want to expand a little bit more uh, in terms of your general thoughts about technology in general or how it works for Spectrum uh, or what advice you might want to give people thinking about this? Well, that's a very profound comment you made. You know, there are two ways of approaching uh, an engineering problem. One is to take existing technology and maybe extrapolate that existing technology and figure out what you can do at a given moment. Uh, some of us uh, tend to be dreamers, and we start at the other end. Namely, what could you do if you had the best of all technologies or technologies that didn't even exist? And so uh, that is the approach that, uh, that I took in thinking about the fact that someday everybody would want to have one of these things, uh, and we're not going to worry about whether there is a, a limit to uh, the amount of spectrum and it was available. But the, I had another thing going for me in this regard, and that is we are so inefficient in how we use the spectrum. That's why we can go a million times better and still know that we'll go further than that. Think about what, uh, the way we do, uh, uh, even today, a cell site will have an antenna and transmit energy. It starts out with 40 watts of energy and it transmits in all directions. And the only useful part of that, L is a tiny amount of a, a 10 to the minus 12th uh, difference between the power, that little bit that comes to the antenna of your radio. All the rest is wasted. Well, you know, if you're a dreamer, you say, well, someday we will be able to transmit of just a little bit of energy uh, and pick that up because we can go from one point to another and not spread this stuff all around. And guess what? That technology uh, exists today, and we're even to go beyond that. So Marty, I was taken uh, by your comment that so much energy is wasted, and there's so much opportunity there. One thing that came to my mind was there are faculty at the Jacobs School of Engineering and other places 
who are working on formed beam antennas, antennas that can take all their energy and either spread it or focus it as needed. How do you see all of that coming together for future generations of wireless? And I'll offer this as a starting point. Are we going to see a world in which there are many, many, many smaller antennas or fewer and fewer and fewer mega antennas? And what do these smaller antennas look like and, and what do they do with beam forming and, and energy conservation? Lay out that grander view for everybody. Well, uh, let me uh, first uh, be critical of your uh, terminology, uh, because when you talk about beams, beams are rays, right? This is what a, what a, a beam is. What we can do, and we have been able to do for 25 years, is take a group of antennas uh, and have each of these antennas uh, focus on a point in space. And when you do that, you end up with effectively a sphere of energy around the antenna of the unit that is receiving what these multiple antennas are doing. The more antennas you, got, you have, the smaller the sphere is. Uh, is that technology being used today? Well, uh, in uh, millimeter wave transmission, uh, 10, 20, 30, 60 gigahertz, 60 times more than that first cell phone could do. Uh, yes, they use multiple antennas, but they use them for only one purpose, extend range. The range of a, uh, of a uh, 60 gigahertz uh, antenna uh, might be a, measured at a few yards, but if you use a lot of antennas, you could extend the range. But that same technology, multiple antennas at lower frequencies can multiply the capacity of, of the uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, why, uh, why don't carriers uh, use that today, you might ask? Well, I do ask, why don't uh, they use that today? Thank you for asking that. Uh, they don't have a motivation to do it. Uh, our government allows the carriers uh, to spend a lot of money to uh, buy the right to use spectrum. They, they don't own the spectrum, but they get a license to use spectrum and what they achieve by that is effectively a monopoly because other people can't use it. But the right way to run the spectrum is to make people use the existing spectrum, extract all the capacity they can, and then move on to higher frequencies. So Marty, as I hear you tell these stories, I can't help but think that there is a special role for entrepreneur in society. Perhaps in engineering, we like to think of an entrepreneur as someone who invents an interesting object that fulfills a need somewhere, and that person goes blithely on and develops that and finds the money and finds the team. But in our conversation, we've had a number of touch points where you've said, you know, it was the, you've implied that it was the entrepreneur who needed to upset an apple cart so that vested interests didn't hold back innovation. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Can you give me some uh, examples or elaborate on the need? Uh, because this is something that I don't think many students would appreciate, would understand from the beginning, that by being an entrepreneur, you are breaking up an ossified thing and putting back in some flexibility. Do you have some thoughts on that theme? Well, let me phrase it a slightly different way than you did, Al. Uh, there is one uh, important understanding, and that is, what is the purpose of technology? And te I have a, I've repeated this so many times, it just flows out of my mouth. Technology is the application of science to make products and services that make people's lives better. Somehow, if you forget the people part, the rest of it's irrelevant. And yet, uh, big companies start getting into a mode of they own the world, they are going to tell us what we need. Uh, somehow, the, uh, this is an opportunity for the, opportunity for the entrepreneur. It's the opportunity for every student that's listening to this. There are so many tools available to us today. 
uh, and so many things that have to be fixed, even though we're, the world is better now than it's ever been before. You know, we live longer, uh, we uh, have less disease now, uh, there is less poverty than ever before, we still got a long way to go, a huge number of opportunities, huge number of tools, but you have to remember that it's people that count. Now look what's happened with the cell phone. And we got out of control. We, uh, every year there is a new announcement of a new feature. The, the modern cell phone has more pixels in it than your eyes have. Now, <laughs> now what what's is, the use, perhaps? <laughs> exactly. So uh, uh, somehow or other, we now have, the cell phone has evolved into a suboptimal something. If you try to do, uh, make a device that does all things for all people, it's not going to do any of them optimally. So to me, that's opportunity. Uh, the, the, every person that's alive today is different from any other person. Not only that, every person alive today is different than anybody that's ever lived before or ever will live. And yet, the big manufacturers would like to make one product for everybody. There's not much advantage to that. You know, after you've made a billion of something, you know, a billion and ten doesn't add any, uh, reduce the value. So uh, it, 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 the future that I see, whether it's cell phones or everything else, is personalization. The cell phone ought to be an extension of your personality, not what some engineers think that it, it ought to be. So yeah. Marty, I've, I've seen a pattern similar to this with the themes you've raised. I think I've seen this once before. So let's go back to the early days of the internet. In fact, before the internet existed, and all there were were private nets. You could register to be on IBM net. You could register to be on ARPANET or HPNet, et cetera, et cetera. And if you were on one, you couldn't talk to someone on the other. Then a process emerged. Some linking technology, the internet technology came and broke those barriers down by providing a common hub among them. And then for a short period of time, and I remember uh, when I, you used to spend a week to set up your desktop PC, most of it was you customizing it. I want my song. So what technology or what breakthrough or what new thing are you imagining might be the key to drive the industry in the direction that I think you're, you're imagining and that I think a lot of other people would be happy to imagine as well with you. Well, there are two examples that I have to give you that move in two different directions. Uh, when you talk about the cell phone itself as a solution, it's certainly not having uh, uh, apps uh, because right now you can customize your phone. All you have to do is, is select among four million different apps. And <laughs> you could, if, you, if you could pick out the right one for you, boy, you're better, you're better than I am. And the solution that is just obvious, it has been obvious to me for a long time, but in the last few months, it's become especially obvious. Every phone ought to have an artificial intelligence in it. That artificial intelligence analyzes your behavior uh, and it optimizes your behavior because you're, you're the human, you're the purpose of this thing. Uh, and so uh, when you want to do something repeatedly, it will either create an app for you or go find one. And you don't have to do that. So there's an example of how the phone is going to be personalized. But when you talk about the networks, uh, we've gone too far in that direction. The uh, internet now uh, tries to serve everybody. And once again, it's doing this suboptimally. Don't you think there ought to be an internet for students of, in the elementary and high schools? So you don't have to worry about the pornography part. You know, yes, somebody's going to have to curate this, yeah, but uh, the internet is going to be the source of information for all education. And if that's the case, there ought to be an educational internet. There is already a law internet, isn't there, Lexus? Yes. So uh, why not have multiple uh, internets, once again, to serve human needs? So uh, I'll just so posit a hypothesis, which is perhaps we need an entrepreneur who is not going to be, let's say, subservient to the vested interests, 
who would want to drive such a thing into existence? Do you think that model might, that might be part of the solution? Opportunity. Bingo. Okay, so let me uh, take a minute to go back to the actual first handheld cell phone call and ask a, a little bit more about it. You've already alluded to the fact that, hey, we did this to have impact. We did this to send a message, not just what was on the phone, but to demonstrate what is possible to the world. It sounds like a lot of homework was done to set that up, stage it, make it work right. You want to, would you expand on the logistics and all the planning that went into that? And I'll start with uh, the, the first piece, which is, why did you choose the day that you chose, uh, as well as the person you were calling, that you called? Well, we had to do a press conference. That's the way you get attention for a lot of people. Uh, uh, we had to arrange uh, a venue, uh, and a, a ven two venues we selected were New York and Washington, because that's where the money is and where the uh, political uh, influence is. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I keep talking about, the, or everybody talks about the first phone call. Uh, a phone call is not just a handset. It takes infrastructure. And so we had to actually build a, a base station and a terminal uh, uh, remotely located from the Hilton Hotel, which is where our press conference was. Uh, and uh, uh, this took a, a lot of effort. So the, the uh, April 3rd date was arbitrary, but it was a date that uh, we f believed that we could put all of this stuff together and make it work. The key event on April 3rd was a press conference, and we also had a, an interview in the afternoon by a local uh, TV station. Uh, all those things are recorded, fortunately. You won't recognize me because I didn't have a beard, <laughs> but, I, but I still talk like that. Uh, but uh, I was wakened in the morning by our uh, press people, and they said, there's a, a, a reporter that would like to interview you. And I said, that's fine, uh, I, I'm available, but I want to do that interview on the street. This business of, of standing up in front of a group or sitting in a chair and demonstrating a phone does not demonstrate the freedom part. And there I end up standing on the street, walking down Sixth Avenue, talking on this phone. You know, people, you know how blase New Yorkers are? Their eyes were wide open <laughs> looking at this thing because, you know, there were no cordless phones back in, in that day. So even, even the blase New Yorkers were watching this. And uh, so now I had to demonstrate that this thing was actually working, which of course is the only thing on our mind there. We had been, the night before, we had still were tweaking this thing to make sure that it was working right. Uh, and I decided, you know, I think I'm gonna call my counterpart uh, at AT&T, the guy that is running the car telephone program at, at AT&T. So I reached in my pocket and took out my telephone book <laughs> Does that little uh, black book literally? <laughs> it was literally, so it tells you a little bit about the primitive times we were in. And I called up uh, Joel Engel, Dr. Uh, Joel Engel, and uh, I said, uh, Joel, this is Marty Cooper. He said, hi, Marty. Uh, I'm, uh, Joel, I'm calling you uh, on a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a personal, <laughs> portable, handheld cell phone. You could see I was not adverse to rubbing his nose in it. Uh, uh, Joel uh, was very polite. Uh, he, uh, uh, even uh, to this day, he doesn't dispute that we made that phone call. He doesn't remember the call, but I, I guess I don't blame him for that. But uh, Joel's attitude was the Bell system was dominant. They ran everything. He could not understand what this little company in Chicago was doing. He literally could not enter his mind that we could influence the direction of history, but he was wrong. So Marty, you told a lot of interesting stories about the origins of the first handheld cell phone phone call and all the excitement around it. But I think many in our audience would like to know, how far down the road were you looking 
when you staged that first big demonstration? Did you ever envision that something the size of a brick could become something the size uh, of a very small parcel? Uh, something the size of a brick with 25 minutes of battery life would become something that has two days of battery life. How far down the road were you looking when all of that was happening? That's a very profound uh, question, Al. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, being a dreamer is uh, important, and being an optimist is important. You do have to understand the technology. Uh, and in fact, uh, in my previous career, uh, I started a battery business for Motorola. So I understood that the battery technology was advancing, that someday it would be possible to make a battery this big that, that was equivalent to the battery on this phone, which was that big. So it, 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 when you're actually making a demonstration of a product, you really do have to understand the technology. I really had to know what the capabilities of large-scale integrated circuits were. Uh, and. Uh, uh, believe me, that was not, even then it was a, not a simple thing uh, because uh, we, I had experts in the semiconductor industry telling me uh, that uh, when they had a, a pitch of one micron, uh, the, you know, the smallest dimension you could have, that they were very getting very close to the limit. <laughs> you know, that uh, we, we're, we are not going to be able to go much more dense than that. Well, as you know, they're now talking about one nanometer but a thousand times better, which is a million times smaller in area than they had when this guy, who was an expert. So uh, there is a combination of being a dreamer and really understanding factually what, what the future could, could bring us. There is a balance there, uh, and uh, how do you get that uh, balance? Uh, I don't know, but uh, it, uh, one thing is understanding about humanity, the other thing is, uh, is uh, understanding about immersion. So uh, uh, everybody's got their own way of doing it. So there is lots of wonderful messages in the telling of that story. One of them I want to start exploring uh, was triggered when you said even blasé New Yorkers paid attention. Because I think in that era, if you walk down the street and talk to yourself, they thought you were crazy. Today, oh, what a wonderful person, multiplexing, multitasking. How does all of these, how do all of these techno technological advancements really change who we are as people? And what does it mean for the people in the future, for the young people in the future, for the young people who have never known anything but this hyperconnectivity. What are the advantages and the disadvantages, the pros and the cons? What are your thoughts about what we've made possible and where it might be taking us? Well, uh, let me take the, the dreamer's approach to uh, start with. Uh, the uh, ability to connect people full time, 100% of the time, so they have the freedom to be everywhere, number one, is going to revolutionize education. Since you're a professional in that area, uh, just uh, think about uh, what's going on today, that we have teachers uh, lecturing to students, each of whom has access to all the information of the world. There, certainly, uh, there's got to be a more effective way of, of delivering facts to people than telling them things that, where they know more than the teacher. So we're going to learn how to do that, but teaching, the teaching profession is, is going to change. Uh, let's talk about uh, health care. Uh, I have an annual physical examination, uh, sometimes every year, sometimes every five years, uh, and uh, it's essentially worthless. Diseases don't wait for your examination to happen. They happen on the fly. And think about the fact, if you have sensors on your body or a all-knowing sensor, that knows when you're about to have a stroke, and by the way, we have such a sensor today, that you can anticipate disease. You know, your body is full of, of baddies. That, and, and why are you not sick all the time? Because you've got an immune system that uh, captures those things, stops them. 
well, uh, why not have a sensor that senses that you're about to start, that your immune system has lost control, take a pill, talk to your doctor, no disease. Think about that, a world with no disease. Cancer, if you've got a few cancer cells come up, zap them. So uh, uh, the concept of collaboration, think about how uh, when Einstein uh, came up with his theory of relativity, uh, he would write a paper, uh, send it to his pal Niels Bohr, uh, that took a couple of weeks in the mail. Neil Dorr would think about it for a week or two, send it back. Uh, the uh, conversation took months. You pick up your phone now, call Al, hey, I got this idea. What do you think of it? Boy, tell me about the increase in pace that's happened. Uh, safety. Uh, my grandchildren have had cell phones from the age of five years old. You say, oh boy, that's really bad. They're going to become addicts. Yeah, but they'll be live addicts because uh, <laughs> when they were standing out waiting at school for their parents to come uh, and their parents were late, they could always have the phone and call somebody for help. So uh, we're, we're only at the very beginning of what the, the concept of a cell phone, kind of ridiculous that we call it a phone, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what the concept of being connected uh, is going to do for uh, humanity. We are going to be a very different people. And I have to emphasize that, El, because uh, in your usual way, you really got to the heart of it. Uh, the people of the future are going to be very different than we are. They're going to be smarter. They're going to have a shorter attention span. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully, it's going to be a better world. So, Marty, thank you. And I want to tease out three things from, uh, from your answer, because you really got my head spinning. So the first is, uh, you mentioned, uh, I think your phrase was, what is it, how does a teacher teach to students who might know more than they do? Well, I just happened to run this school of engineering. <laughs> it just happens to be the fifth or the sixth biggest in the country. It just happens to have 9,600 students. So you're making me feel a little queasy. It's like, hey, wait a second. I am a, I have a big machine that is about to be disrupted. There's a change coming. Have you thought about, uh, so imagine a scenario. I'll hire you as an education consultant, digital education consultant. Do you have a, th a couple of thoughts about the advice that you would give me? Hey Al, next year your students are different and this is what you have to do about it. Have you thought about that? Well, of course, your uh, biggest problem is managing the faculty. That's a, that's a whole <laughs> new problem. Uh, but the whole nature uh, of what a teacher is uh, is going to change in the future. Uh, and maybe uh, teachers will be more efficient. But the main role of the teacher is, is to stimulate the students and teach them how to use the tools how to teach them how to dis discriminate between real stuff and, and bad stuff, and to do this in a way that doesn't intrude on their uh, shortened attention span. Because I don't think of, of a modern person, uh, I like to think of myself as a modern uh, person, but uh, I, uh, in my day, had to listen to one hour lectures. I don't think you could do a one hour lecture today. Uh, uh, so teachers are going to have to adapt. They're going to have to do, uh, learn new ways uh, of teaching, and, and the whole concept of what teaching is is going to change. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Socrates had his own version of teaching and uh, did pretty well at that, and maybe that is the role. So we still need, need the concept of a teacher interacting with students, but I think that interaction is a lot more important than uh, lecturing. Having said that, I'm just a dreamer. You're, you're the guy that's got to implement this. Yes, well, uh, let's just say it's my goal not to play the part of Bell Labs or AT&T in the, in the story uh, oh, yes. uh, when, I'm when I have an entrepreneur who Al, points you, something out. I know you're, uh, you are going to adapt and well, you're going to be one of the problem solvers. Th th thanks, but let's say the jury is still out on, on, not, on that one. The, 
The uh, other big theme that you really stimulated in my mind when you gave your answer about the effect of the phones on the future really was digital health. And I really, I really did resonate with what if you knew what you needed to know in time so that you could implement an intervention to take care of someone's health. So you know that a, a, a stroke might be occurring or you know that there may be some other problem or uh, you know that someone just got sick with a flu and you need to do something. So let me explore that from two angles and I'm curious to hear what you say. So the first is there is a growing number of sensors. You can buy a ring you wear, you buy a wrist you wear. There are uh, stick-on sensors that look like uh, fancy high-tech band-aids that are going to start collecting all this data. And so the two thoughts are, one, is there a security issue now that there is a digital aura surrounding our bodies? All these sensors are low-power sensors. They're designed to transmit the answer no more than a meter because that's as far away as you can hold your cell phone. So all of a sudden, if you're within a meter of someone, you might be leaking data. And then the second is, to a generation of doctors who look at patients with a snapshot mentality, here's a chart, there's the snapshot, this looks good at the moment, you're fine. So trend data is typically not so emphasized there. What revolution in the doctor's mind do you think we're going to need? So the first one was everyone has a digital aura. How do you protect that? Uh, and the second one is, okay, so what are the doctors going to do about that? Well, let's start with the doctors. Uh, okay. I, I've already offended all the teachers in the world. I may as well take out the doctors too. <laughs> but uh, think of what doctors do. They, uh, they uh, diagnose uh, and then they try to cure you. Uh, in the world that I perceive, uh, there are no diseases to cure. Diseases have all been anticipated. So you are, you're still going to need surgeons. Uh, you're still going to need uh, the really complicated kinds of diagnosis. So the doctors still have a role, but it's a very different one than they uh, have today. Uh, and much more efficient so hopefully we'll need fewer doctors, uh, but guys who are much more specialists in the really complicated stuff. So let's go on to the uh, issue of uh, what the London Times said in their uh, interview of me last week, uh, privacy. Uh, do we have privacy now? Really, to, to anybody that thinks anything in their life is private is kidding themselves. Uh, and, and that's unacceptable. We, we have to learn how to handle that. Uh, and you, you know that there are ways of doing it. If, you, if you've got sensors in your body, you know, uh, there has got to be a way to encrypt that information. So even though it's only going a few feet, you know that somebody can intercept that. Uh, and it's going on over the air sooner or later. Uh, you know, the, the cell phone, I think, is ultimately going to evolve into something that you carry with you that we call a server. And that's what reaches the rest of the world. And then on your body, you've got very, you've got a, uh, an implant next to your ear uh, that we will call the phone uh, that, uh, with a, a, a powerful computer in it. So if I want to talk to you, uh, I say, get Al on the phone. And the computer says, which Al do you want? You got the Al. <laughs> and I say, you know, Al Pisano, and I'm talking to you. So, uh, uh, the, the whole concept of the, of, of the way we uh, do all these things uh, is now changing. We've got a bunch of sensors on the body, and all these things feed the uh, server, and the server connects us to the outside world. That's my perception of what the future cell phone is looking to be like. So, Marty, we've, we've been having a wonderful conversation in many, many different directions. I want to try a, yet one more new direction out with you, and that is 
to take some questions from the students uh, of the Jacobs School of Engineering who knew we were having this conversation today and who submitted some questions. So well, let me try one out on you. So from a student uh, in uh, electrical and computer engineering, so electrical engineering, Dr. Cooper, how do you figure out a new technological trend or breakthrough? How do you see what that is? And what advice can you offer for a student to be able to understand the market adoption of the yet to be realized technologies? So a question about how do you see the trends to know what to do? And how do you do something when no one's ever done it before? So a spectacular question from a student. Marty, what's your advice? Well, first of all, I'm not qualified to give advice to all students, but I can tell you what my experience is in this regard. Now, the first thing you have to learn how to do when you want to come up with a product or a service uh, for uh, uh, other people is remember that they're humans uh, and you have to un put yourself in their role, immerse yourself in their role, really understand it. And I have to tell you, uh, the, when I look back on my career, uh, where uh, f people keep uh, pretending that uh, making the cell phone was the end of my career, which I, I would like to think <laughs> was just the beginning, uh, there were a number of steps in that thing, each of which made me understand more of what the concept was. So I came up with the very first, would you believe it, uh, car telephones when there were not lots of car telephones. It was a very su successful product, but that's when I realized that uh, when we learned how to do uh, things small, uh, that uh, that uh, a big trap in your car wasn't very uh, effective. Uh, it took me 15 years to really understand the idea of the freedom of, of, of uh, having a, a phone that you could carry with you. So uh, immersion is crucial. You, you cannot uh, uh, pretend that you know what other people do unless you live what they are, are doing. It's arrogant to think you could go uh, otherwise. Uh, but uh, I have to emphasize what I said previously, you also have to be prepared to take risks. Uh, you have to uh, understand the, the meaning of the word strategy. If you don't do something better than your competitor, and there are always competitors, then you don't deserve to uh, start a business. Related to this, another, que another student has posed a question, again, from electrical and computer engineering. And I think this is a very human question. How did you manage to keep yourself motivated when you were starting a business or pushing, fo pushing forward a new technology? Perhaps you had a thought, uh, a negative thought on potential failure. How did you personally deal with those? So I'll interpret this as, where was the human emotional strength that, you know, how did you get your human emotional strength that enabled you to push through in the face of uncertainties or all these other issues that you've been pointing out? The student wants to know, what box did it come in, Marty? Can you give him one? You no, know, I'm just teasing. You have to be a, a, a psychologist to figure all, all of that out. Uh, but first of all, I am an optimist. Uh, second of all, I'm a dreamer. Uh, so if you have a dream, uh, that dream has got to be overwhelming. It's got to be something that, that you really look forward to. Uh, secondly, you have to believe uh, what Paul Galvin taught, uh, and that is uh, that uh, you cannot fear failure. Uh, of course, everybody has doubts. Uh, and in fact, those doubts are very important. The skeptics are important. So you have to challenge yourself continually. You have to be paranoid. But being paranoid doesn't mean you're afraid to take a risk. I have a large engineering school in which I have hundreds of students, thousands of students, studying the technology. So what I'm hearing from your answer is that there is a way to combine your technical expertise 
with your hopes, dreams, and empathies for the rest of the humans on the planet. You had your particular way to combine it. I'm wondering if there, you know, there must be other ways to combine it. Did you just have any closing thoughts on what we could do in an engineering school to make it easier for students to hold on to their dreams and get the technological strength that they need so that they find their way to walk the path of their dream? There's nothing more exciting, more valuable than having an idea and executing the idea and making it happen and seeing the results. Uh, why in our educational systems we say, well, when you get out of the real world, you can do that, but meanwhile, you just have to work hard and take tests. Uh, why can't we let our students ex uh, experience that excitement of, of uh, having an idea for the first time, executing an idea, seeing the results of your thing, having passion? Because, boy, that's what keeps me going. Is the, if you haven't figured that out by now, it's the passion of looking at a future that's better to, than today and knowing that I had an idea that maybe somebody else didn't have. But at least for me, it was the first time I had that idea. And it is just so exciting. It makes me feel wonderful. Uh, if you can get your students to feel that at some part, doesn't have to be all the time, but if they could reach that at some point during their uh, education, uh, they will be all the stronger when they get into the real world. So one final thought related to that. Every school, mine included, struggles to have an experiential side of the curriculum. It's expensive. You have to buy hardware. It takes up more space. You have to equip a lab. You have to gather people and set rules for safety and lab standards and stuff like that. But, but when the students make something that works, their eyes light up. This sounds like that was functioning within you. I can imagine you extremely excited the day that you're making the first handheld cell phone call from the streets of New York, even if you had planned it out, you must have been glowing when you did it. Yes? Tell yeah, by, uh, by all means. So if I could capture that energy or set up a scenario for the students to feel the energy that you were feeling then, am I succeeding at my job? Of course. Uh, but let me give you an example of how that's done uh, at a much different level. Because I have a protege. I met a, a young man, five and a half years old, in a swimming pool at the last week. I was giving a speech in, in this uh, hotel, uh, and he approached me and said, uh, are you a teacher? I said, well, no, I'm, I'm an inventor. He says, you know, I'd like to be an inventor. So that was uh, uh, seven years ago. Uh, he's, uh, my friend uh, Sebastian is now 12 years old. Uh, in his class at school, they have told each of those students, start a business. Wow. And all by yourself and do as much as you can to actually go from the idea to uh, commercial. And so he, his name, uh, I don't want to embarrass him, his name is Stokelt. He thought, you know, the word stoked has energy <laughs> to it. So I'm going to make t-shirts with the word stoked on the back. He happens to be uh, uh, have enormous uh, artistic talent. He made a, a uh, graphic that's uh, very colorful and thing that goes on. And he went into the t-shirt business uh, with his, his strategy that uh, the word stoked has meaning to it. Uh, I just got a report from him the other day uh, that he is now uh, profitable. <laughs> he sold it up. Wow. He bought a bunch of T-shirts. He bought a machine that will print this, uh, his stuff on it because it turns out that when he wanted to outsource that, they would charge him too much money. So uh, uh, I, that's kind of a stupid example, it seems. Uh, but here, these teachers have figured it out. There must be a way uh, that you can have a, a, 
a course that embraces uh, all the silos, right? Including business, including risk. So uh, I don't know if that's useful, uh, but it's an example. So Marty, I see you're wearing a National Academy of Engineering pin. So I'm presuming you're proud to be a member of the American National Academy of Engineering. Tell me a little bit about the role you've had there, the interaction you've had there, and how you might be helping them adapt to the future or what the academician's role would be. It's another aspect of your life that I think uh, many people might not know so much about. Well, uh, the essence of what you can do when you get older, you certainly can't keep up with all the technology. I'll uh, you know, try as I uh, might, uh, the things are just getting beyond me. We had Carver Mead speaking to us last week, and uh, I did get out of it that he thinks Einstein was wrong, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure I know exactly why. But the one thing that doesn't change is uh, your neurons uh, do not fade away like the rest of your body does. Uh, and the one important thing that happens when you get older are the ideas. And uh, the, what the National Academy does, I'm also a, a member of the, uh, uh, the uh, Technological Advisory Council for the uh, FCC. And the exchange of ideas is attacking the real fundamentals. So I could talk to people about a future where uh, we don't have carriers del delivering information uh, inefficiently, and where somewhere or other there is a monster artificial intelligence that's organizing uh, all of our uh, 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 radio transmissions, doing it efficiently, and doing it a million times more effective than today. Uh, and that's the role that the National Academy of uh, Engineering Sciences Medicine that does. They allow people to interact, experts uh, in their field, to exchange information, which they now do very efficiently. Uh, and uh, it, it also gives a role for people that are beyond the stage of just fixing uh, immediate problems. So let me bridge from there into a related topic, which is, as the world of wireless encompasses more technology, more purposes, as the impact grows, I'm wondering what you think about the need for a surge in international cooperation in this field. We have a, a standard setting board which to me looks more and more like a battleground everyone has after they've developed their pet idea and then everyone convenes to see which ideas uh, survive the standard setting process. And I'm wondering what you think about the need for more pre-collaboration before that point. Or am, I in the or am I going in the wrong direction here? I'm sort of asking you, how do you see this field growing with more and more international participants? And how is that going to be arranged or evolve on its own? Well, Al, uh, I think we're all screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> Present uh, company uh, excluded. Yeah, uh, all the rest of them. But not, oh, okay, not, right, not right, right, all right. Uh, let me start out with one uh, comment. I hate war. You know, uh, if there's anything that's antithetical to the whole concept of engineering, it is war. Engineering is constructing, making lives better, war destroys lives. There is something wrong with that picture. And, and so uh, you're down at the, in the weeds where stuff gets done, but somehow or other, we don't cooperate. And I don't understand that. Uh, and, and my only solution to that uh, is that we keep touching uh, on the concept of education. Uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that uh, my children are smarter than I am. And my grandchildren are uh, geniuses. And my great-grandchildren are not old enough to be geniuses yet, but they're going to be smarter than their parents. And, and it's my hope 
that intelligence is going to solve that problem because it's irrational. And, and the standards things are, are irrational. There are places where standards are very important, but there are other places where standards get in the way of progress. The thing about the Europeans are now telling Apple, uh, you should not uh, use the uh, lightning uh, thing because you've got another one that ought to be universal. And, and my reaction is, you know, it, why do we need a connector at all? Can't there be something else? And I want to see progress. And yes, I, I don't want to have every single uh, unit require a different power supply, uh, but there's a balance. We haven't learned how to hold those conversations yet. And one of the problems uh, is uh, you look at our Congress and, and how many engineers are there uh, in Congress. So maybe we ought to have, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in silos. I don't like the engineering silo. Uh, I would like a silo of, uh, if you'll forgive me for saying this, because it's you know, controversial here at UCSD, uh, but design is really the overweening thing. Design in the concept of how do you, what's the optimum way that you put things together? So I don't think the uh, uh, future engineers, and I'm certain uh, the way that you're doing things now is you're trying to get engineers uh, to uh, ha have multiple talents. But the idea of, of somebody going out in the real world as an electrical engineer as I did and think that they could make a product with only electrical engineering, that's, uh, that's ludicrous. So what we need is uh, to stop thinking in boxes, stop thinking in silos, thinking about humanity, about solving the problems of, of humanity and doing it in a way that, uh, you know, nationalism is not bad, but nationalism that starts wars, nationalism that, uh, that makes uh, standards uh, a matter of pride and ego, all those things are stupid. So all, all, I, uh, maybe uh, I'm being too much of a dreamer, but I'm hoping that the cell phone will el eliminate stupidity. How about that for an objective? So Marty, I have to say, uh, if I had to pick a formal stopping point for an interview, that is a spectacular quote to end on. Uh, perhaps the cell phone will eliminate stupidity. Marty, I want to thank you very much for being with me today and having this wonderful conversation. I not only learned a lot, but I got very excited about the thoughts and visions you offered. So thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, everyone who listened in. Uh, and I hope that all of you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. Thank you very much.